a man visits his doctor for his annual health check. But the doctor has some very bad news. He goes, Sir, I'm afraid I have to tell you, but you need to stop masturbating. The man is irritated. He goes, but doctor, why? And the doctor goes, well, mainly because, you know, I can't measure your pulse if you don't. <laughs> Telling a joke is probably the most efficient way to tell a story. And I love to tell stories. I love to evoke emotions. My name is Ulrich Laven. I'm a screenwriter and a director. And today I want to talk about how we can use storytelling to transform society. I want to talk about gender equality. And at the end of my talk, I want to teach all of you a writing technique that is easy to learn and you can change the world with that. Do you want to hear that? Yes. All right, so now I'm going to geek out about storytelling for the next 16 minutes. Remember, you ask for that. <laughs> All right, the oldest story we know is a tale of a volcanic eruption that took place approximately 37,000 years ago. Let that number sink in for a while. 37,000 years. That's tens of thousands of years before the written word was even invented. Narratives and story are an essential part of every human culture. May it be the prehistoric cave paintings that tell us the stories of animal hunts. May it be the ancient religious stories of the Bible, the Quran, the Torah. May it be poetry. May it be literature, or that strange Netflix series your girlfriend watched the last weekend. We, as human beings, are almost addicted to good narratives, and everything is connected by stories. Storytelling is communication. The storyteller takes an experience, and then they look for a way to share that experience with you, the audience. They use humor and suspense, they make you laugh, they make you cry, they make you wonder. And I wonder, have you ever read a book or watched a movie and you totally got lost inside the world of the story? You totally lost track of time? If the storyteller does their job well, this was going to happen. Not only will you logically understand the experience they try to share, you also will be able to relive this experience. And you may ask yourself, what's the point of that? What's the point of reliving experiences of other people? Well, Otto von Bismarck once famously said, only fools learn from their own experiences. Geniuses learn from the experiences of others. And when I hear the story how a member of my tribe ate poisonous berries and how he got sick and ill and how he died, you know, a horrible, painful death. I don't feel so inspired to have that experience myself. Would you? Most of us here never experienced war, but somehow we all know we don't want to because we know the stories of our ancestors. The most interesting fact about storytelling to me Stories don't even have to be based on true events to trigger real experiences in us. So, question. Who here knows the Harry Potter series? Raise your hand. So, almost everybody. For those who don't, please put your fingers into your ears because now I'm going to drop a major spoiler, right? So, when Albus Dumbledore died, Told you. <laughs> to be more precise, book six, page 556. <laughs> the readers had a real strong emotional reaction. You know, some cried, some threw away the book, they were shocked. And you may ask yourself, why? 
how it's just a fairy tale story about wizards and witches. What does that have to do with our everyday lives? Albus Dumbledore never was a real person, right? But to the readers, and because they interacted with the story for years, he kind of became a real person to them. He kind of became a real friend, a real mentor, a real role model. The ability to draw real experiences from fictional stories is a powerful tool. But through stories, we are not only able to reflect on our past and learn, we are also able to find new solutions to problems that may seem unsolvable. One of those problems could be the issue of gender inequality. You see, I personally believe that we should strive for a society in which men and women are treated equally. Equality always means equality of opportunity. Everybody should have the same opportunities to participate in a society. The big and controversial question here is, how can we achieve that? And I think the more radical positions are tending to demand for strict laws and regulations to achieve gender equality. You know, like asking for quotas, for example, or I don't know if you know, in Germany, there is this big movement to artificially change language to make women more present. And I think it has good intentions, but this demand is kind of strange and sometimes even dangerous in my perspective, because it's something you rather would expect to read about in a George Orwell novel, you know, kind of, kind of newspeak. In the end, you are not creating gender equality with this. What you are creating is you're creating a cancel culture and this narrative for an eternal struggle for dominance. You know, men fighting against women, women fighting against men, they are both not equal partners. They are enemies. And as any good psychologist will tell you, true change always has to come from within, within our society. Let me tell you an interesting but true story here. In the early 2000s, American scientists noticed that there was an increase of female students in the STEM fields at their universities. And a few years ago, a study was conducted to find out what motivated those young female scientists to work in this male-dominated field. And a lot of those women said that the greatest inspiration for them was a female scientist by the name of Dr. Dana Scully. I give you a little bit of context here. Dr. Scully, she studied physics. She went to medical school in Stanford University. And after that, she was recruited by the FBI to work as a medical consultant. And the most fascinating part of this story is she never was real. She was one of two main characters of a very popular television series called The X-Files. And to give you a little bit of perspective from a screenwriter, she was a fleshed-out character with strengths and flaws. She never was the love interest of that story. She was treated equally by their colleagues. She and her colleague Fox Mulder shared an equal partnership and true, uh, it's a true friendship, it's a friendship story, basically. And her gender kind of didn't matter for the story to work. Everybody treated her exactly as they would have treated her if she had been a man. Therefore, Scully became a role model for many young women. Scully showed the women that it wasn't strange to pursue a career in the STEM fields. This effect is called the Scully effect. And it's one of many positive media effects we know of today. 
Evidence from various psychological studies suggests that when we create stories in which the gender equality already has become a status quo, we also normalize gender equality in our perception of reality. And so, therefore, we transform culture by doing that. So, at the beginning of my talk, I told you, I promised you, that I'm going to teach you a writing technique to make the world a little bit better. Let's do that now, but I need a little bit of your help, okay? So, picture this. Imagine a young screenwriter who has written a script. It is a story about an old, wasted, cynical detective, probably an alcoholic. And it's also about a murder case. And there are a lot of suspects, like a professor, a priest, a yoga teacher, a mother, and a very attractive young model. So here's my question for you. When I told you that the protagonist is an old, wasted detective, who here imagined that this detective is played by a man? Raise your hand. Interesting. So, and when I told you that there is a very young, attractive model involved, who here initially thought that this model has to be a woman? Raise your hand. So, you see, those are stereotypes. And you have them because our culture and our stories repeat them over and over again. Of course, we know that there are very tough women working as detectives. And we know that there are very attractive young male models. So, what do you do when a screenwriter presents you a script with those stereotypes? Well, you can take the script and just hand it back to the author and say, hey, Kevin, your script is very sexist. Please correct that. So Kevin goes back and he does the rewrite. By the way, I don't know why I call the writer Kevin, <laughs> but it kind of works in this scenario, okay? <laughs> so Kevin goes back, he rewrites the script, And what usually happens is he feels the urge to overcompensate. The detective becomes a woman. And you can't say anything negative about a woman because you don't want to be sexist anymore. So the woman is not that old and wasted anymore. She is in her early 30s, right? maybe late 20s. And she's not cynical. She's not an alcoholic. Maybe she drinks a glass of wine once in a while. But overall... She's a very competent, confident, and positive personality. And you read this script, and you think to yourself, Kevin, <laughs> first your script was sexist, and now it has become kind of propaganda. You created some very interesting characters, and now they are watered-down versions of the original. So we don't do that. Here's what we do instead. We use a technique that is called the CT method. And you can use this technique to create gender-balanced narrations. First, we take the script away from Kevin. <laughs> and then we lock the text. So there are no more changes allowed. Then we make a long list of all the characters involved in the story. And we ask this question. Which of these characters has to have a certain gender because the story wouldn't work if they didn't? So, for example, if a character is giving birth to a child, she obviously has to be a woman. If a character portrays uh, an old historical figure like Abraham Lincoln, he probably has to be a man. You cross those characters off the list. And now the fun part begins. What you do is you take a simple coin, and then you flip the coin once for every character, 
And then you change the character according to the coin toss. If the coin says heads, it's a man. If the coin says tails, it's a woman, or the other way around, it really doesn't matter. So you change the gender according to the coin toss. I did that in the script with a detective, and I flipped the coin, the coin said tails, so the detective became a woman. Don't forget, the text is locked. There are no more changes that could be done with the text. So we're talking about an old, wasted, female detective with a drinking habit. Everybody treats this detective exactly the same way they would have treated her if she had been a man. And somewhere out there, an older actress will say, thank you for not being able to play that role, because here's a fun fact. Did you know that older actresses have a difficult time working because there are simply not enough roles and characters written for their age? So, we continue, and we flip the coin over and over again, once for every character. And what is going to happen now is, once in a while, there won't be any changes. The gender will stay as intended. But sometimes, the gender switches. And thereby, we break our stereotypes, which is good. So at the end, we just have to change the names of the characters. We change the pronouns in the text. And now we have something you could call a gender-balanced narration. Okay, so? For example, everybody treats the detective exactly the same way as she would have been treated if she would have been a man, you see? Um, and if we do that, we normalize gender equality in the story. And if we normalize gender equality in our stories, we normalize it in our cultures. And if we normalize it in our cultures, we normalize it in our society. And if we do that, equality is no longer um, a vague concept, it has become a truth. You also can use the principle of the CT method to fight racism or homophobia. And if a 50-50 chance is too much of a risk for you, you also can use a dice. Roll one and two means the gender changes. Everything between a three and six, it means the gender stays the same. I just can encourage you to give it a try. The next time you tell a fairy tale to your niece, use the CT method. If you read The Hobbit to her, it may become the adventures of Bilba and her dwarf friends. <laughs> and I can promise you one thing. She will love it, and you will change the world one story at a time. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. <laughs>